over are not acceptable beers to bring someone like myself. Not that I'm a beer snob, but you know what I'm saying. It's like bringing somebody yellowtail wine. It's all, it's all downhill from <laughs> Don't there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, that or Copper Moon. <laughs> Kev, I'm going to be heading to... Uh... Kevin, I'm going to be heading to the hammer tomorrow. Do you need a drop off, buddy? Oh, this around. Oh, look at this. We got, we got, a, you know not what? A I would not say no, but I have to hug you. That's the challenge. <laughs> it's the COVID hug. I, I will put on a big bubble wrap suits. I don't Solo know. If suits. I, I don't know if I have six suits. suits, a bubble wrap. <laughs> we can work something out, Aaron. Thank you, sir. We got some. Uh, we got some good friends on the line. We got some first-time people. We got some followers. I appreciate all of you guys being here tonight. Um, yeah, this is still like litmus test. I, I get depressed every time we hear it's going to be another three or four weeks because, um, like, three weeks. What or is this three or four now? Three and a half. Four here. We've been under emergency. Four. Yeah, because yeah, it was March. It was March fifteenth, sixteenth, I believe, when it when it when shit went down in Ontario and uh, it's just getting, uh, you know, there's good days and there's bad days. I've done a, a bunch of these. I've done uh, one with a buddy in Stratford with Dean Blundell on his, uh, on his series radio show. I've done uh, one with Jason on real hospitality live and uh, a couple of, I've done a couple of private chats, one with a hospital and, and one with uh, I'm doing one with my family. God. <laughs> Saturday night, <laughs> my cousin Michael, who I haven't seen in 20 years, is setting one up. And it's probably the only time I'm going to be able to see my dad before you know what. Because um, my dad's really old. Uh, so there's no filter here, guys. So uh, I'm apologizing in advance and I'm not apologizing at all. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I hope there's value in this. I mean, I, I watch guys until I get bored and then I hang up. But we got some, uh, we got some good, uh, we got some good video evidence of my past that we can look at and we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, how are we doing there, moderator Robbie? Where are how are we doing there, Liam Neeson? So what do we want to do first? What are we going to make a cocktail first? Tell us how to make that drink. Okay. Let's so, so a number of years ago, once upon a time, thirsty traveler goes to. Gotta pull up my plumber's crack there. Goes to Lima, Peru, and, and, and goes to Peru to discover the magic of Pisco and Chicha. And I'll tell you tonight, we have it in a lovely decanter. Um, I'm, I'm in the basement of my mom's house in Berlin. She doesn't like bottles. This is what the bottle looks like. And it's readily available, Quebec, Alberta, BC, Ontario. Sometimes it comes in and comes out. You can tell I love art therapy. I actually printed off the bottle and then made a, a fancy frame for it. Machu Piscu, um, or Machu Pisco, sorry. Uh, Melanie Ashner and her sister Lizzie Asher uh, have created this wonderful Peruvian spirit um, via Florida around 2004. I met them at Tales of the Cocktail in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. And they really wanted to bring something of their home country to the United States, Europe, and they're killing it with this fine product. Um, Mom likes to decant, which I have mixed feelings on. Um, air in the bottle being the biggest thing where, you know, the air inside the bottle will start to fight the spirit if there's more air than there is spirit. Um, what I often do is I'll... I don't think you can see this. Maybe I can pull it off. Um, I, I always, before anything goes into a decanter, I always try and um, date stamp it. It's like stuff that you should do with your stuff that goes into your freezer. Because you forget when you buy it and it goes into the freezer and you just stamp it down there and then you pull it out and it's slightly freezer burnt and you don't know if it's from two years ago or five years ago or in my mom's case, seven years ago. Uh, it's kind of gross, but we're using Machu Pisco. Uh, not currently available at the uh, LCBO, uh, but it is, I, I have found it across Canada and I know it's readily available throughout uh, the United States of America. We have some uh, neighbors from the South watching with us today. Let me just get comfortable again. Um, 
this is really the first drink you're going to have. Uh, your your entry point into Peru is always going to be Lima. Uh, I would say 10 times out of 10, but I'll give it a benefit of the doubt and say nine times out of 10. And um, when you get there, they're going to think you're you're uh, you're American because of our, our voice. And uh, hello. Hi. Hi, you guys. You two look at lovebirds on the couch. The love seat right there. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, they, I just got the kiss cam going. It's amazing. Uh, they'll ask you if you've ever had a Pisco Sour. Um, it's kind of not unlike a, a whiskey sour. It, it's a, a predated cocktail that just uses a, a different spirit. Historically, uh, Chile and Peru both fight over the uh, creation of Pisco. Uh, prior to Pisco being uh, created, invented in Chile and Peru, they were drinking a, a Spanish equivalent, kind of a Spanish brandy, but it was produced from uh, pomace, which is the, the squeezed uh, leftovers of the grapes. Uh, mostly uh, all of Pisco these days, both in, um, in Chile, Taurus is a, a very big manufacturer of Chilean Pisco. Um, I'm getting nods from Aaron over here, which I like because it lets me know that I'm, I'm on the proper path. Um, and things like Machu Pisco from, uh, from Peru or from America via Peru uh, is made from a grape juice distillate. And uh, it's a very easy drink to make and it, it's kind of fun for environments like this. So I thought, why not? So here we go. We're gonna start with, and I'm, I'm kind of, most of my um, performance gear is in a locker down by the distillery district in Ontario. And it's hard to get into the locker under these, uh, under these guidelines right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm MacGyvering, I'm making do with what I have, which I'm sure in a lot of cases we're all doing right now, like drinking, you know, the beer that the friends buy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So we have a, we have a chilled, you know, um, kitchen table, home sense, $10 shaker, but it works. The one thing you want to be, remember, if you have multiple shakers, these lids are sort of proprietary to the shaker that they come with. So when you start mixing and swapping out one piece for another piece, they're not always going to work as well as they should. But this one is intact. I can tell uh, by the wonderful markings, uh, made in China on the bottom, uh, wonderful thing. So I'm going to just uh, get some of the chilled ice. Out of Sorry, there. I thought that that would look like an urn to me for a moment there. Oh, uh, it, it could be mine. Oh, shit. It probably I just dropped be. the egg on the floor. Can you give me, okay, um, can, you, can you make sure Aaron's mic is up? And Aaron, walk us through what you do and the good work you did. We worked together in November, I do believe. That was the last time we worked together. That was probably the last time I saw it. I better run and get another egg because I just dropped my egg on the goddamn floor. Give me 30 seconds. Aaron, take it away. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, so yeah, I've worked with uh, with Kevin. I've been a bartender in Toronto for the last seven years. I now represent Di Serrano and Tia Maria. So I make a fair number of sours. So when it comes to shaking an egg white, I can talk to that. So what Kevin's going to do is he's going to add his egg white to his Pisco sour, his Pisco, his lime juice, whatever else he's putting in there. Um, everybody's recipe varies just a little bit. The key is you're going to shake your egg white twice. You're going to shake it once with ice, which is the wet shake. You're going to shake it once without ice, which is what we call the dry shake. Some people like to do the dry first. Some people like to do the wet first. We call that the reverse shake. I'm a component proponent of the reverse shake, the wet, then the dry. And Kevin's back with another egg, so I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin. Okay, so you're, you're talking about both shakes. I was just going to do a single wet shake. You want me to do a dry first? No, uh, hey, dude, this is your show. I was just, I, I was, just, you I know, just get I was just doing color bits. commentary. I just want to get to the good bits. Okay, so I was just color commentary, bud. Okay, so let me make sure we have our ice. The chilled shaker, okay? Our glass is actually sitting, waiting. Chilled glass, chilled glasses hold the, the length of the drink for a much longer period. Let's see how this goes. You guys can see this, right? So what we're doing is we're separating the white from the yolk. I will use the yolk tomorrow morning, maybe in a spinach omelet. Okay, so our egg white goes in. Aaron, Aaron, yes, are you sir. there? I'm here. 
You want to talk to why some people like and don't like the the raw egg going into the drink? I mean, Rocky had a dozen of them every morning when he was training to beat uh, Apollo Creed. But I think I think yes to egg white. Absolutely. Um, if you've never had an egg white sour or a cocktail with an egg white in it, uh, people are like, oh, my God, raw egg, that's gross. You know what? It's not. It's delicious. You're not going to taste it. Uh, the salmonella is not actually on the inside. It used to be on the outside of the shell. That's not a problem anymore with proper pasteurization techniques. But when you shake your egg white cocktail, whether you do it once like Kevin's going to or whether you do it twice, wet and dry, like I just mentioned, what you're going to do is you're going to add air and you're going to emulsify that egg white. What that does is it lengthens your drink. It's going to add air. It's going to emulsify, kind of like when you make a meringue, when you're baking. You're adding air. It's going to lighten it, so it's going to get fluffy. You get that nice foam on top, like a good foam on a head of beer. Uh, but you're also going to get a longer, silkier, richer mouthfeel. So when you're drinking your cocktail, it's just going to hang with you a little bit more, and it's just going to make you want to go back for that next sip. Right. Back to now, Kevin. Let's go. Going in, our Pisco, I'm free pouring here. About, so we're going to roughly about two, two and a half ounces, maybe three, you know, give or take the occasion. We have our lemon juice. Some, um, some recipes do call for lime and you can go back and forth on them. I've seen them, they're both readily available on the web uh, from trusted sources. Um, we have our simple syrup. I'm using roughly a, a one and a half to one ratio of sugared water uh you can go from two to one to one to one again it's all kind of uh subject to your own taste but we're in here and we're pretty much ready to go we have our pisco we have our uh, egg white we have our um lemon juice and we have our simple syrup i'm gonna put it on mom's best shaker that's what we like to call it and we're gonna give it i'm gonna give it 30 seconds aaron do you agree with that you know 15 some people say we're not doing the dry wet i'm just gonna do one big one i'm doing it seated which is incroyable as far as i'm concerned who's who sits shaking a cocktail but here we go yeah if you're gonna do just a single wet i would go 20 to 30 seconds if you're gonna do the double shake then you're talking 8 to 10 12 seconds tops each Oh, and we got Jason. We got Seth in the background there. He's doing his. Oh, how about this one? Uh, uh. What? You're ready? No, you're not. We got it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. We got that Nick Nemeth is in here. All right, uh, Nicky. I think they're from St. Catherine's way. Good old Canadian boy. Are you down in St. Catherine's, Mr. Nick? There we go. All right, now let's see. How we did. We're gonna get a bit of a vacuum there on our shaker. Everything's rolling out. See, we didn't even practice. We didn't even rehearse. And here we go. Now, some people do a, a cocktail glass. Some people go for like a Nick and Nora or a coupe. I'm kind of liking that look right now. And you can see that velvety smoothness coming from our egg white. Here, I'm gonna tilt this down just a touch. And then the capper, we're gonna, we're gonna put a little unnecessary lemon garnish on the side. But then we're gonna go by way of Trinidad with this good stuff, the Angostura bitters. On vanilla ice cream, people, peeps, fam, vanilla ice cream, oh, yeah. just a bunch of 48% alcohol by volume, herbs and roots and stems and flower and bark. Wonderful. And in Lima, they like the three drop thing. Now I, I did four and I just, it looks like I'm dyslexic. But look at how good that looks. And it tastes even better. Where, where, where did Jason go? Where did Jason go with his? Nick, where's yours? Oh, you went down the side, see? Everybody's got their own style to it. Can we get Nick up there? Hey, Jason, where's yours? Come on, chef. Oh, hey, just tell him I made yours first. He made mine first, so he's making another one right now. Oh, he's making that. You know, this is only a 30-minute show. How's that taste <laughs> to you? Time. 
wonderful stuff, man. So the way I like to describe cocktails, at least in my world, is that the spirit often acts as like the, the skeletal structure of the drink that you're having. And, um, and all those flavors and all the elements and tangibles that you hang off of them, are, they're, the, they're the, the, the skin and the muscles and, the, and everything else. But the, the, the spirit, the, the 40 proof or the 45 proof, often I think of it as like the bones and like the, the, the backbone, the structure of it. And everything else is kind of flavor. And right now, I'm all flavor. This, this drink is great because you get some of the earthiness and you get the firepower of the Pisco, but then you're also playing with that beautiful, simplistic um, dance of the, the, the fresh lemon juice and the, um, and the simple syrup. And then the, the, the Angostura bitters is, is still more aesthetically because it's floating right on top of the, the velvety smoothness of the, uh, the egg white. It's, it's there for kind of play and show, but it's, it's a great drink. You don't feel the alcohol in it and uh, they go down very easily. And they're a lot cheaper in Lima than they are in Canada or the United States. I promise you that. So if you need a reason to drink cheaply, get yourself in a plane when you can, fly to Lima and have a Pisco Sour in one of the, the great old Spanish colonial squares because you will not, um, the bartenders look better than me as well. So, so it's a win-win. Cheers, guys. Hey, Faye, how you doing, Faye? How you doing? Uh, Kev, cheers from your buddy Stan the Vodka Man as well. He said to say hi. Stan's? Oh, I love Stan, man. So we got a lot of uh, liquor reps. Hey, you can't Kevin. Write this off. You can't write Here. this off. Hey, Faye. How you doing, babe? Good. Rogers was down in our area until right now. So we were on phone, but I'm glad to see everybody. I, Hi, I all. Called them. I called them and, uh, and got them back up. So this, <laughs> this episode, there, there's, a, there's a lot of great backstory behind it. Um, I, I, I'd never been to that part of the world before before we, uh, we ventured to Peru and we went for summer solstice in, into Rami, which you'll see in the episode. I don't know if any of you have seen the episode. It's only 22 minutes. It's a pretty good watch. Um, and we drink Pisco and we also drink Chicha. And Chicha is the indigenous drink that we're gonna start the show with and we're gonna get into Pisco near the end of the show. One of the, the interesting tips, I get a lot of people that watch Thirsty Traveler and they say, I watched that episode and at the beginning you were so sober and by the end you were wasted. And I'm kind of going, what? And they go like, yeah, by the end of the show you were just tanked. I'm kind of going like, we shoot the show over like eight days. And sometimes we shoot in reverse or we'll jump scenes. And this one was an episode and I don't particularly like to do it that way, but this is an example of one of the shows that we did where we almost shot it completely backwards. And the hard thing about that from a production okay. standpoint is, um, is that you, you, you can't fix things that you've already shot that are deeper in the show. So if you, if you learn new language or you learn new information or you get more passion uh, throughout your travel, there's not an ability to add it back in because you've already shot the ass end of the show. And in this case, we, 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 we had to sort of because of uh, logistics around um, around summer solstice into Remy, we, we had to shoot it in this way. We had no other choice. So it, it's not, it's still an example of a great show as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I get really sick in this show. There's a behind the scenes and maybe if we're gonna try and do this again, maybe next time we'll show the behind the scenes version. So you get to, once you've seen this one and it is up on YouTube, if you go to Thirsty with a Twist, not that I don't want you to watch it with me here, but you can find it. Um, you can see some of the behind the scenes and I, I refuse to fake a fucking drink. I was being told to fake a drink and I said, if you care for me that much, you'll give me a day off. You'll give me two days off. And they were like, no, we can't do that. And then I was like, well, fuck you. I'm not faking a fucking drink. I'm not drinking, you know, Pisco and making it water. There's no way I'm going to do that. And, um, and you'll see a bit more of that in the behind the scenes episode of Thirsty Traveler Peru than you will in this one. But I'll point a couple of those things out and then I'm gonna hold a couple stories. Do you wanna to get to the episode right now? Robbie, how, Robbie, how is the, um, how is the uh, Pisco Sour that uh, your husband, uh, Chef Jason made you? Well, it's my first time having one. What do you think? It's not gonna be the last. <laughs> it's not, right? It's kind of deceptive. 
It's really good. I, I'm not a sweet drink person. I like the I like the sour. I like the the lime and the yeah. sour. And, it's good. And, yeah. Again, kind of pretty much probably. And I, again, guys like Stan and Aaron and Nick will probably attest. You know, a, a, an homage to something like a whiskey sour, which was probably made. You know prior to this in in history's sake um sours are, are great cocktails because they just they line up in terms of simplicity and in terms of what we like in terms of mouthfeel again that egg white is just you can make this drink without the egg white if you're really against that sort of thing aaron was speaking to it when i i, I still have an egg on the floor here <laughs> i don't know what to do about it <laughs> hang on hang on there are also vegan uh, egg white substances. I don't know if you can see it down there. That's for you. Have, have you made cocktails with those? Have you, have you tried those? Yes, I have. Uh, and Nick Nemeth is uh, is, Nemeth is doing a shameless yeah. plug. What do you what do you plug? No, that that's that's one of the what one of the, you the, use? The, the the foamer. That's uh, yeah. that's what I use in some Oh, the, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. where are you getting where are you getting that? Are you getting that at like um at Whole Foods or no, in, you, Cocktail Emporium in, uh, okay. in Toronto has uh, yeah. So and they'll do they'll do mail outs and deliveries and stuff like that. Yep. How you doing, buddy? Nick. Oh hey me. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen you in ages. I haven't seen anyone in ages. I'm uh, going well, like, crazy. <laughs> I haven't seen you in ages. 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 Okay, so do you want to watch the show? And we're gonna we're gonna we we pull the four or five little stops where I'm gonna fill you in on some background detail. Um, you're gonna meet uh, Johnny Schuler, who is uh, God, the, the king of Pisco. I haven't seen him since Tales of the Cocktail, probably 2013. It's amazing how you'll you'll have opportunities to meet great people from around the world, just practicing their their craft, their 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 passion, their their hobby, their life, and um, and then you'll go five years without seeing them. And honest to God, in this industry. It's, it's amazing how many times I've gone five years without seeing somebody and you'll run into them in a hotel lobby, in a convention center, in an airport, and you'll just pick up like it was yesterday. Um, it's one of the fortunate things that I got to experience while I was doing this. We, we did Thirsty Traveler through the War on Terror, 9-11, through SARS, through the avian bird flu, through the liquid and uh, gel bands, through the shoe bomber. And we got through all of that unscathed, knocked on wood. And there's nothing I would change about it if we had to do it all over again. Uh, it taught me what I was meant to do and, and who I was meant to be and become. And the show only worked because of the good people I got to hang out with. You know, I, I'm, I consider myself sometimes nothing more than a, a knowledgeable court jester. But if I can pull a great story out of you and, and I can have a fascinating moment in time with you and share it with other people and tell a, a great story of who you are or who your country is or what your wine, beer or spirit are, uh, I've done my job. And I think we did it really well. And I know we did it really well. Um, OK, so what do you say? You want to run this a little bit and see how it goes? Yep, let's give her. Let's give her a try. OK, okay. who's going to do the who's going to do the bump bump? Okay. Sounds like you just did. I think I just did. I think I just did. Cheers to that. Okay, you ready? Okay. Here we go. Ready? Okay. The Thirsty Let's Traveler go. Peru. Let's go. Here we go. When Peruvians decide to throw a party, oh, I'm telling you, they throw one big party. Here I am high in the Andes, my friends, and it's not just because of what I got going on inside this mug. This is going to be one fantastic adventure. And it's all downhill from here all the way to the Pacific as Thirsty Traveler soaks up the spirit of Peru. And I celebrate two very special drinks, Chicha and Pisco. Salud! Oh, <laughs> 
Halfway there. Oh, my God. Thanks. The climb. A view. Hello and welcome to the sacred valley of the Incas. Would you look at this place? Beautiful stone walls con constructed centuries ago, some say even a thousand years ago. Coming all the way out here to Orante Temple, I can see why the ancient Incas called this place the home of the gods. This is beautiful. And this is some pretty rarefied air I'm breathing. About 9,000 feet above sea level we are. Most people, it takes a day or two to acclimatize. I've got no time to let altitude get in my way because there's way too many fun things to do here and too many cool drinks to be had. Right now, You're supposed to take this as a preventative measure. So we're going to go to the this. park now and <laughs> get stoned. <laughs> that is to keep this in your mouth, not chewing. So you're not going to chew, you're just going to say some right there. So it's almost like tobacco, chewing tobacco, right? You just said uh, That's all. I can see in your eyes, you. <laughs> I have altitude sickness. I'm a very sick man. Huh? Yeah, first that. Look, no coyotes. <laughs> yeah. Stop. You have to make a more. Wow, that's good stuff. Are you there? As an experiment, just to see how well I'm doing here. Can you take out your leaves and show me them? And if you look at my mind. I am here. See. So we, we had a bit of a sound drop out there for a bit. I think a couple of us. How long um, did, did you hear any of it at all? Uh, not really. Uh, right, uh, we were in Ola and Tatambo, uh, up in the hills. And then the, the volume kind of dropped out. Okay. For the introducing, uh, for the introduction of uh, Del Miro. Okay. Um, want me to take her back and, and give it another try? What do you guys want to think? Do you want to, or we can just move, what do you think? Just move, go back? Just a little bit, maybe go back a minute. Okay, let's do that. Just to where we're at the cathedral and we meet Del Murrow because he's an interesting cat. Yeah, about here? Yeah, maybe around there. Okay, let's give her. Well, it worked. The Catholic Church, beautiful. This is a very authentic Peruvian town. Beautiful. Yeah, this is part of the Sacred Valley. Welcome to this place. Thank you very much, my friend. And you got a little market around here. You want to get me going on some? Yes, yes, I got, uh, something nice for you. Okay. Is it, which way? Where are we going? That way. Okay. My trip is about to start off with a buzz, and that's even before I get a drop to drink. A place where we can find that beautiful thing. That beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> you almost make it sound illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we're looking for. This is the, the, the naughty stuff. Yeah. This, this uh, is the magic stuff. Yeah, this is an ash made from uh, fruit peels. I see. So that's just banana ash. This is cocoa leaf. And apparently this is very good for uh, for altitude sickness. And even if you don't have altitude sickness, you're supposed to take this as a preventative measure. So we're going to go to the park now and <laughs> get stoned. <laughs> the idea is to keep this in your mouth, not chewing. So you're not going to chew, you're just going to say some right there. So it's almost like tobacco, chewing tobacco, right? You just uh, yeah, That's all. I can see in your eyes, you. <laughs> I have altitude sickness. I'm a very sick man. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the, the, Del Miro was actually um, a lovely cat, and um, 
there, there's, there's, he, he was what's considered our fixer. In, in certain countries, you have what's considered a, a carnet program. And a carnet program um, is sort of a, a universal, not in every country, obviously, but it's a universal way of moving goods cross border. And so for our camera gear, when we go to a carnet country, it's much uh, easier, quicker, cleaner than when you go to a country that's not on the carnet system and you have to find what we call a fixer. And that's a guy in the ground that will pay off all the adjusted people that need to be paid off from the um, from the airport, from the um, from the customs agents, uh, so on and so forth. And they'll protect you, and they'll get you, they'll keep you moving forward as opposed to stalling and uh, spinning your wheels. Del Muro was an interesting cat. He had a very tough life. He grew up in the uh, Amazon. And he explained to us the entire process of making cocaine. <laughs> um, very matter of factly, but in such hyper detail, you knew that this guy couldn't be making this shit up. And I was like, if only I'd written it down. <laughs> it, it's a filthy, it's a filthy process. Um, but he he was a he was a really great gentleman. And what he was doing is he was giving us sort of a rustic version of how farmers would keep themselves going uh, throughout the day by taking uh, banana ash, the, the peels of bananas, uh, cooked down over an open fire, made into an ash, rolled up in coca leaf, which is one of the main ingredients in cocaine uh, after it's been cooked, boiled, burned, uh, chemicals added to it, whatnot. Again, I didn't write any of this down, so I'm paraphrasing. Um, and you'd basically roll the uh, banana ash in the coca leaf and stick it down like cha, and it would just sort of seep into your system over the course of the day. And they wouldn't. They and often a lot of the workers were paid in these little um, coca pockets that they would just keep on them. And whenever you were, it's like a Red Bull, only uh, only different. <laughs> um, Red Bull gives you wings, and uh, coca leaf and banana ash give you. Uh, I don't know, magic powers. So th this guy was really good, but he got off, he, he got out of the gang that he was associated with. And now he's living a, a good clean life, but uh, it, it's, it's part of the common man's um, ritual. It's like, I think having, for lack of a better comparison, it's like having um, espresso in, in Torino or in Milan, you know, you go out, you know, you have a, you have your quick little shot, you go back to work and you're, you're a bit, you know, spiked. And, um, and he was a great guy while we were in uh, Cusco in Olenta Tambo. We'd get things done, spoke the language. He spoke both um, Spanish and the uh, the indigenous, the Quechua language, which was uh, highly important for us because of where we're going next and because of the time of the year it is. And um, really cool cats. Um, one of the guys that you'd almost like to keep in touch with, but, you know, one of those, you know, those lost ones that you always say, I'm, we're going to stay in touch. We're going to be friends for life. And, you know, unfortunately it's not always the case, but a uh, good guy. I'm glad I got to say something positive about him because um, he really helped our trip. So um, you want to move on? And if anybody's got, you know, hand gestures work too, like no volume, good volume. No. And then we'll try and figure something out. All right. Robbie, Jason, chef, take it away. Ah, that's good stuff. As an experiment, just to see how well I'm doing here. Can you take out your leaves and show me them? And if you look at my mouth, you're a is the first time. Okay. You're kind of all over the place. Yeah. No, I'm here really looking at pisco. But before we get to the pisco, you said there's another drink. Yeah, yeah. Chicha, right? Chicha. Shall we? Shall we boogie on? Shall we go somewhere else? I don't know that we are getting better. And better. No, I'm, I'm feeling pretty. I'm feeling pretty healthy right now. I tell you. <laughs> Corey, enough with the chewing already. It's time for the thirsty traveler to make tracks and find some chicha. The Quechua Indians make this stuff, and take my word, you won't find any of it in a bottle. Yeah. Okay, so if they have this outside their house, it means we can go in and yeah, talk yeah, chicha. That is for good luck. Okay, <laughs> there you go. I like that. There it is. Some of the biggest corn you've ever seen in your life. Beautiful nice Peruvian one. corn. This is what the chicha is made from. Chicha can be this. Yes, aja is in Quechua. Yeah. Our host, Alicia, reportedly brews some of the best chicha in town. And I'm about to get my 
first taste of this ancient brew. So, chew it. This is a, a man size. <laughs> That's a thirsty traveler size. Oh my god. This drink is considered as sacred. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now that's not a pisco sour, although it does have the frothy. <laughs> it, it has a similar frothy head on it, and that, that's a, a Who Garden glass. That, that that that's a big twenty-two ounce uh, glass of chicha. So this is an indigenous drink, and we were invited into the family home. And again, what the fixer does is he goes ahead of, of you a little bit, and he finds a family that's willing to have white people in their home. Um. This woman, uh, her name, um, I have it down here. Oh man, I just heard her name. Lovely woman. She'd never, she'd never seen white people before. She'd never seen Caucasian people before. And she had never had anybody into her home before that wasn't immediate family. And you'll see the lovely dress that she was wearing. They live in a, like a sort of an earth floor compound very nice, really large, larger than any of our apartments in the uh, in the GTA and uh, and beyond. Um, she was wearing her wedding dress from 22 years ago. She didn't know what to wear, knowing that television crew was going to come to her house and film and that these people from America were coming to film. And um, and she, that was her wedding dress that she pulled out of a plastic bag as we arrived. And the whole thing about chicha is it's it's brewed in in forty. I think I think we kind of go over it very fast track in the, the episode. It's brewed in forty eight hour batches. So most of the people that will make chicha, they a they make it at home. They have two giant clay pots um, in their compound, in their in their house, and on their property. And they'll make one today. They'll start another one um, tonight. And then that, you know, so it's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you know, Monday. And then you have the Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, you get, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, when it's available and ready for sale, they'll hang a bamboo um, rod outside of their house with a red cloth uh, signifying that Chicha is available at this residence, uh, replaced by a red plastic bag from the local, local supermarket now as we found out, less sexy, but I guess still effective. And what you would do if you wanted chicha, you would bring your own vessel and you would go to the house and you would barter. And a lot of the people in Cusco and Olatitambo, um, you know, they know the person that makes the best chicha. Again, it's all subject to taste, but they would, um, everybody has their own favorite producer of chicha. And chicha is nothing more than the big gnarly corn. He called it uh, achete in Quechua language, in the indigenous language. And it's basically dried and pummeled in like a mortar and pestle and mixed with river water. This is where it gets interesting. And then the brewer of the chicha, who was always female, never male, always female, always made in the house. It's one of their daily chores and responsibilities while the men are off working, I guess, in the fields or in the mountains, whatever the men do. Um, they spit into the clay pot of chicha several times because it's a large vessel and the natural yeast in your mouth, we all have it, um, is what activates the fermentation process. Now we're dealing at altitude. And if you know anything about cooking at altitude, oven temperatures vary. You know, baking a cake in Toronto at, at 250 meters above sea level and baking a cake in Colorado, right, which is mile high, are two very different things. Temperatures and, and timings and, and all of that changes. And fermentation actually changes with altitude as well. Anyway, this stuff was unfiltered it was like a it was like a very low alcohol monk spear something like you'd get in a belgian uh, abbey in uh, in belgium at a, at a trappist monastery wasn't unpleasant on day one um it looks kind of murky uh, but i had four of those big glasses of it on day one and Typically, we'll get the we'll get the scene on day one, and on day two, we'll go back and we'll we'll cover outside exterior shots, me walking in, anything that we didn't miss. If we have the time, we'll get some extra additional flavor of the town, 
things of that nature. So day one was good. Day one was top shelf. And, um, and we can keep rolling on this now. But you're going to see Chicha again. Maybe I'll just kind of go over this one now so we don't have to stop again. You're going to see Chicha again. And it kind of flops into the glass when it's being poured to me. And this is the other batch. This is the Monday, Wednesday, Friday batch versus the Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday batch that I had, which was good. The Monday, Wednesday, Friday batch the next day leads me on a different path. And you'll see as it kind of falls out of the scoop, in it looks like whipped cream. And it's just not what it's meant to, to be. And I managed to... Well, I, I was sick. I, I I got the I got the COVID on that one, but I managed to warn off uh, Mike, our uh, our soundman, and Brad, our cameraman, to not drink it, and they cannot ever thank me enough because of what happened to me shortly thereafter. But let, let's let's roll and look for the plopping of the chicha uh, round two, day two. I have to, first, we need to drop to the Mother Earth. That's the way to be grateful with the Mother Earth, of course. Sokaiukoi is in Kaija. Sokaiukoi. Sokaiukoi. To all our friends and enemies as well. And the enemies. Yeah, actually, my enemies would be really happy about me drinking this right now. <laughs> Immediately, there are very young tastes of beer. And again, because it's made from coin, and it's some people call it like a, a corn beer. He's going for it. Look at He's challenging me. Oh, man. <laughs> In this case, nice, yes, to, uh, let's say, to help our spirit to, to get better. My spirit is feeling better. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm going to finish this. <laughs> I am. You must do this. Salud. All right, now we're cooking. You just wait till you see what this Peruvian pot left is going to unearth next. See the <laughs> The Incas were some pretty smart people, smart as the Romans, in fact. Not only did they figure out for themselves that corn made a really decent chicha or weak beer, they also figured out that Mother Earth could cook up a pretty darn tasty meal. That's what I'm about to find out for myself right now, as Del Miro, Mama Alicia, and friends are waiting to cook up a storm for yours truly, the Thirsty Traveler. The Pachamanca is an ancient method of cooking that the Quechua Indians still use to this day. How do you say Pachamanca? Pachamanca. All you need are rocks, earth, and fire to make one heck of a natural oven. Chicha time. And to get things off on the right oh. foot, well, we better have some chicha. Salud. Salud. Muchas gracias. The chicha mustache. <laughs> Our lima beans. It's just not the coals cooking it anymore. It's the, it's the stones that are going to yes, cook this yes, food. Yes. This is really unique. A traditional style of cooking you definitely do not get to see it every day. This is really impressive. It's all looking great, but there's something else on the menu I need to show you. Look at these guys. Okay, so the pachamanca, an all, an all okay with. It's uh, potatoes and lamb and lima beans and the earthen pit. I'm fine. These guys, however, these are not pets. These guinea pigs are actually a meal. These cute little adorable guys are actually a staple of the diet here in Peru. You know, sometimes it's good to know where your food comes from, and sometimes it's bad to know where your food comes from, because I'm going to be eating one of these real soon. Sorry, little fella. I'm sorry. In less than an hour, dinner is served. And the lamb, potatoes, and lima beans are done to perfection. So good. Kevin, do you see this? Oh, no. Oh, no. This, this is something special. Yeah, this is something special. Sweet. 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 Would you like some cooling? A little bit of cooling for you, and then a little bit of cooling for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, sweet. You know, you can pull out the old, it tastes just like chicken routine. <laughs> so I got to clean the bones on my very first cooling. I don't know if I'm going to be calling for takeout for it anytime soon, but do you know the, do you know the wave? Do you know the wave? Yeah? Okay. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get the... <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> if only I could speak Quechua, I think I'd have more people here doing the wave. But don't worry. I know a place to go where there's lots of people. 
It's another beautiful day here in Peru, and I find myself in the fabled city of Cusco. We're way higher than the Sacred Valley. We're about 11,000 feet above sea level. And I tell you, what a day to be here. Every year, Cusco puts on a festival of grand proportion, as you can tell. It becomes the center of the universe for this ancient festival, worshiping the sun. On a day like today, there's nothing I'd rather do. The fest is called Interremi. This is what $300 American gets you. A press pass, access to the best seats in the house. Anti Ramey is held during the winter solstice in June. It starts close to dawn, and you can bet it goes well after dusk. sort of a moving spectacle, but if there's one constant, it's probably the chicha. Okay, this is where the real party is. The Inca king and queen, they've left Plaza de Armas. They've hiked uphill all the way to the outskirts of Cusco to this beautiful ancient Inca ruin called Sasuke Waman. It sounds like I'm saying sexy woman, but in reality, I'm saying satisfied falcon in Quechua. And if you can see around me, there's gotta be 80 to 100,000 people here celebrating the festival of the sun. The dancing is gonna go till the early evening. The chicha drinking will go on all night long. It's a terrific way to praise the sun and say goodbye and see you next year, the Inti Remi. All right, so there you go. Just like we did, just like we did yesterday. Yeah, the king, he's using his chicha. He's blessing Mother Earth. He's dropping it on the ground to uh, ask for thanks and, and just bless this beautiful day we have in this beautiful country we're in. Chicha is a big part of every religious ceremony here in Peru. Yeah, chicha. It's a Rami. Um, I, I made a production note here. It, it's not, I don't know if you saw the plop on the, uh, on the chicha. It went by pretty quickly. Um, the, the cooey was kind of cool. Uh, they're really well taken care of uh, guinea pigs. Um, they, they, they're free range. <laughs> um, they're fed nothing but grass. They're healthy. They're tasty. You get the sweet grass. It comes through and the taste of the meat. Um, they're, they're, they're well looked after until they're picked up to uh, be skewered and killed and served for lunch. Um, I made a note to myself, it, 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 for a lot of us, um, if you ever do public speaking or you do any sort of public presentation, whether you're behind a bar or you're in an open kitchen where you're working, you know, sometimes going back and watching, you know, what you've done at a certain occasion or a particular time, it, it, it's really valuable. Uh, growing up, having worked a lot of my life on television, these were things that we were taught to do. And um, it's not always fun watching yourself. I go back to, remember when you heard your voice on an answering machine and you went, I don't sound like that, do I? Does anybody, is anybody old enough to ring anybody? Faye, okay, no, you're Faye, come on. But you know, your voice always sounded different when you heard it back not through your own audible, but through an, an audible coming back to you. Um, as I was watching that scene again last week, I realized you could tell where I was sick. I was nailing those lines, you know, and those lines are written by me and they're not really rehearsed. I know what I want to say and I come out and I say it. And I don't say uh or and or like that often. It's something I, I talked about with Bourdain once, which was really kind of cool. However, um, what I noticed in that one particular scene was I wasn't smiling or I wasn't joyous. This was the longest day of the year and I was at Inti Rami and there was 80,000 people. And it was like, it was crazy environment to work in for sure. I noticed I was doing my job, but I wasn't loving my job because I was sick from the chicha the day before. I had the sweats. Uh, we there was really, there was no spot to get out of the, the altitude and the heat of the 30 degree Celsius day, 30 degree Celsius at altitude, 11,000 feet hits you way different than at a thousand feet or at 250 meters above sea level. Uh, we were really ripe for the picking and because I wasn't on my A game, I, I made a note to Robbie and to Jason. 
uh, the moderators tonight. And again, I thank them for doing all, most of the work for this. All I had to do was show up and make a cocktail and uh, talk to my, my family here. Um, th those are little things that when I look back, I go, man, if only I could have done that different. There was no way for, that I could have done that any better than I did. I think I got through that, the, the jargon. I, th I think I relayed the information well. I did it in a timely fashion but I didn't have a smile on my face. And that was because I was fighting the, the inevitability of the, the sickness of the chicha. I lost in the next six days, I lost 11 pounds um, out both main, you know, I was going to, I was going to promote it as a diet coming back to uh, Canada. I was, I was in my Muskoka bathing suit wear. Uh, I wouldn't let it get the best of me, but I, I swear to God, it almost did. And you'll see that in the behind the scenes thirsty traveler of Peru. Uh, it wasn't a fun time. And because we're sort of at an impulse and we're, we're, we're all kind of like street dogs and sled dogs. Um, we just, we just had to run it and I, we got through it, but I wasn't happy that I wasn't smiling more in that scene. And that, that's sort of something that I pick up on that I don't think you guys would have picked up on, but it was something that I thought I, I would bring it out for people that are thinking about doing more work like this and when you're working alone you're working in a vacuum so when you're doing videos of yourself cooking at home or if you're doing a mixology at home if you really don't have somebody looking out for you 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 know it's your own it's it's all you got is is what you have so it's really important to look back and make sure that you're happy with the uh with the finished result as jason late look at that lame shake what what is that that's just blah 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 yeah, sorry chef that's lazy that that's pretty lame shaking. We got a couple of guys here that would school you. Oh. He's trying not to hit me in the side of the head. Oh. <laughs> there we go. That's a bit better. That's yeah. a bit better. All right. Um, okay. Moving on. I think we're uh, I think we're almost out of Interami and we're heading down to Ika, I, I believe, to Johnny Schuler and to Pisco. Okay. Here we go. Chicha truly is unique to the Andes, but there's another drink here in Peru that everyone knows about. It's this stuff, Pisco. In fact, some people say that Pisco is Peru. I'm going to find out next as the Thirsty Traveler starts my downward ascent toward the Pacific to talk about this stuff, Pisco. Salud. Pisco, delicious. Well, I'm right out of the Andes and I've arrived in the colonial city of Lima, Peru, nicknamed City of Kings after the Spanish kings who once ruled this part of the world as their very own. And the sea level altitude here isn't the only difference between Cusco and Lima. 500 years ago, the Spanish newcomers, well, they didn't quite care for the taste of chicha. They brought their Spanish grapes and wines. Once they got here, they took it even further. Today, what people say here is the truth. Pisco is Peru. <laughs> one guy in this town who knows all about Pisco. You could say he wrote the book on Pisco because, well, he did write the book on Pisco. His name's Johnny Schuler, and I'm off to meet him now. Johnny. Where are you, Johnny? Over here. Johnny Schuler. Yes, sir. Uh, Johnny's knowledge of Pisco is astounding, and with more than 600 bottles in his personal collection, where do you begin? Pisco town. Come on. This, this, this is this unreal. Is, these are all Piscos. These are all Piscos. To tell you the truth, and to tell you guys the truth, I mean, as much as I liked it, I'm a bit chichin out. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to trying a few of the 600 plus types of Pisco you have. Pisco, this is not a grapa. Pisco is a brandy. Pisco is not made from pomace. Pisco is made from pure wine. This is a brandy that has to retain its great essence. One of the few products in the world that is distilled to proof. We're not allowed to regulate the volume of alcohol by adding water. 
And then we don't want to touch wood. So that, that's obviously why it has no color. No it color. hasn't been in any oak casks. And this grape is Moscato de Alejandria. This is the one that sort of I knew as being truly interesting. It's got weight, it's like that. It's oily, it's yeah. like... Uh, is it like you know, yeah, it almost gets... The, well, it does get legs. A lot on the nose, very quickly. I find citrix, I find uh, tropical fruits in the end, in the back, some raisin. Velvet. Said it better myself, again. Velvet, huh? Very smooth through the mouth. Today, these girls are smooth, fantastic, soft drinks. But as you see, 40, 40 degrees is potent stuff, right? It's a lot of... Quite smooth, and then there's sweetness that lingers yeah. right in the back of the mouth. I, you feel all the, the grape coming out? The, yeah, there's yeah. definitely influence of grape in this. The best beast goes when you like the most. Cheers to that. Salud. There he goes. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at we're having a mix off. <laughs> Get her done. Who got the froth? Who got the froth? In my defense, we have no mute. I couldn't go any faster. <laughs> okay, look at that. Nice work, gentlemen. See, this is the brethrenship. This is the hood, man. This is what I love. Thank you guys for coming out and doing this. There See, it is. That, we, that's a little Nick and Nora, isn't it? Look, look at it. They're using the same glassware. Yeah. Salute. They're, they're going proper. They're going historical. Here, we, chef. Got, we got face friend right there. Here's, Who's face here. friend? He's doing the one-handed shake. <laughs> Don't waste any. No? Uh, no. It's good stuff. Now, Nick, yours is a bit darker in tinge. Yeah, I did the, uh, like, it's like a basically half and half uh, overproof bourbon and uh, disarono sour. I, uh, oh, okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I'll get you a bottle, buddy. Don't worry. Just send me your address. <laughs> <laughs> the life of a, of a brand ambassador and a, and a liquor rep and uh, all that good stuff. But isn't it isn't it true, guys? That like you know, the only way you learn more about the the products that you you love, that you you covet, is by is by playing with them, is by is by a reading a bit of you know, knowing some of the history, taking a tour when possible, if possible, but but actually engaging in the product. I know so many people. Um, well, I know people on both sides, but I I I, I sort of you know, generalize sometimes. And I say, you know, so many people that, you know, Thursday night comes along and the liquor cabinet is unlocked and it's like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Sunday, it all gets locked back up. And it's like, see you in four days. And if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. I don't necessarily agree. Well, you know, I don't agree with that, um, with that, that method of thinking, but, you know, I can respect it and understand it. I just think that, you know, especially in the kitchen, there, there's so many places for liqueurs and spirits to be used in, 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 in braises and marinades and in, in baking. Um, and, and the more you, the more hand time, the more play time that you have with these products, the better you're going to understand them. It's, it's like leaving your grandmother's recipe, you know, when you don't have to go to the book anymore and read every step because you know it intrinsically, that's when you're gonna start fucking with it and making it your own, right? And, and that's what I sort of love about, you know, drinks and variations of drinks and cocktails. You can make a pure cocktail to the book, to the letter. You can get Difford's guides and, and, and read and see what the drink's supposed to look like. And, and once you know it and you love it and you have the confidence in yourself, that's when you actually, start changing it and you make it part of your history, right? And, and, you, and you put your badge, your stamp of honor uh, on, on the product and the way you like to treat it and the way you think it deserves to be, you know, consumed or served. Yeah. Lots of good stuff. Johnny Schuler was such a wealth of knowledge. I wish I was feeling better on that day in his house because we could have just gone whole hog and and right behind his, um, his compound, I'll call it a compound because that's typically what they are in, in Peru if you're living, especially out of, out of Lima, outside of Lima in the, in the countryside. Um, 
he had one of the most popular chicken and chip restaurants. It's, it's almost like the national dish. Ceviche, I think, is the national dish of Peru. But second to ceviche is like what we would know as Swiss chalet chicken and chips. It's a half or a quarter um, open flamed roasted chicken and just the best French fries. Again, potatoes and corn do very well in Peru. And it's just family style. And on Sundays, and we were out there on a Sunday, his restaurant had 750 people in it. He's got four or five restaurants in the in the south end of Peru, sort of down towards Ica, which is where we're heading next on this story. And um, the fact that he gave you know most of his day to us when he had a restaurant of almost 800 people just buzzing with family and friends and relatives is just amazing. And um, I can't thank guys like Johnny Schuler enough or, you know, um, or these two guys down in the bottom left right there because I miss them. <laughs> um, okay. I'm, 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 we're going to play next. Again, I was sick when we played. I'll tell you a story about the odd shirt that I'm wearing after this. But, um, but yeah, let, let's, uh, so the, the first act is always introduction to the country. The second act is largely the wine, beer, or spirit that we're featuring. The third act is, is sort of food, although we didn't really get too much to the food in this episode. And the fourth act is largely cultural. That's the way we make a, a half hour show is roughly 22, 23 minutes uh, by North American broadcast standards. And um, I think we're almost at the end of the show. We just have a bit of the, the culture, which isn't really Peruvian culture, but it allowed us to see a cool part of the country and to show a different side of a country that some people think is, you know, maybe old and stodgy and, and way too historical. And there's a real uh, bustling uh, vibrancy to, uh, to Peru and the young people and what they get up to when they're not in school or at work. So roll it. Let's go. You just can't stay for one pisco at Johnny's. One turns into a fabulous afternoon and a meal with Johnny's friends and family. For a thirsty traveler. And then he'll be thirsty forever. Forever, yeah, see. Oh, yeah, he'll be thirsty forever. Welcome to Peru. Thank you. Hello, Hello. Hello. Hey, you all be thirsty forever. Hello. 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 Muchas gracias. As the saying goes, Pisco is Peru, and Pisco is definitely the drink of the people. From Lima, it's due south to the heart of the Ica Valley, where the missionaries first planted their grapes, and where Pisco was first produced. A great way to tour a vineyard. Look at this. You know, these vines were some of the very first vines planted in all of South America. And when I said this was a drink of the people, I wasn't kidding. All of these grapes are picked by hand by the people of Peru. Amazing. Let's go for a ride, Tatar. Let's go. Okay, can we stop for a sec? Can we stop for a sec? And distillery yeah. is one of Okay, I forgot about that part, but I, I okay, I can ride a horse better than that. <laughs> I was clenching so badly because I didn't want to shit myself because I was sick. And in the behind the scenes, you'll see that after that scene, we go right to the doctor on site of the of the of the vineyard. But I was clenching so hard riding the horse. It looks like I don't know how to ride a friggin' horse, and it wasn't even a big horse. But there was a big clench going on in there. It was a, <laughs> and, and that's the truth. That's the truth. I'll prove it to you. I'll, I'll, we'll go horse riding one day. I can ride a horse. Just that day, <laughs> not so much. Okay, on with the show. On with the show. Okay. <laughs> Oldest in all of Peru. And of course, they also make the mighty fine pisco. All right, friends, this is where our Peruvian wine becomes Peruvian Pisco. Remember, Pisco is technically a brandy, so before you get your Pisco, you need to make some wine. The wine gets thrown into the stills here pure. There's no sulfites at it. There's no extra sugar at the beginning or extra water done at the end. Pisco needs to be distilled to proof. Now, these two guys, they can produce up to 50,000 liters of Pisco each and every year between the months of Feb and April. So when these two stills are busy, they're really busy. The kicker to the 
this fine drink, Pisco, is that there is no aging required. That's right. Never sees oak barrels. Always stays clear. It's because Pisco was meant to be enjoyed young. That's what I'm going to do right now. Salud. Hey, salud. Delicioso. When we come back, I'm afraid things are going a lot downhill. <laughs> that sucks! Production dates. I think I said from February to April. It's because they're in the southern hemisphere, right? So they're they're reversed. So their uh, their fall is when our spring is, and vice versa. That's why they make uh, pisco predominantly in the in the first part of the year versus where we make wine in the latter part of the year here in North America in the northern hemisphere. Um, so that shirt I was wearing. There's a there's a bit of an infighting story. Uh, that was shot on the very last day. That was shot on June. It was shot on June 30th. And I tried to get out of Peru in time that I could get home July 1st to see my two young sons, um, Max and Jake. I wanted to see them for Canada Day. And I, I was sort of, I was just coming out of the sickness. Um, I couldn't sleep that night. We were staying in Ica. And, and that, that little oasis that you see at the end, that's an actual, although it's a bit man-made and manicured, that's a fucking oasis in the middle of the desert. How that thing exists, it's 50 miles of sand 
all around it, except for that one little place, which was like a bar and a nightclub opportunity and a couple of huts. We didn't stay there. We were staying right on the edge of the desert. But that night I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. So I kind of slept on the toilet, but I was feeling better. I had my Kevin Rush back <laughs> with me. So I made a T-shirt over the course of the night, sitting mostly on the toilet, drinking a beer, a Peruvian beer, and watching TV out of the corner of the bathroom. It was a perfect fit. So I was quite content. And I was drawing <laughs> on the shirt. And you may have seen, I, I probably posted it on Facebook before. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll post a photo as a thank you to all you guys for sticking with me through this. Um, and it said, it's supposed to say Chicha es Diablo. Chicha, the is drink the that got me sick, is the devil. <laughs> and I worked on this shirt all night with a, a red Sharpie and a, and a black Sharpie. And if you travel the world, you never travel without Sharpies. They're like, you, you travel with a Sharpie before you travel with Band-Aids if you had to. <laughs> so I make this shirt and I wear it to breakfast. And every, I'm going like, this is the shirt I'm wearing today. And... And then Mike, the sound guy, the newfie, um, who lives in Calgary now, God love him. Um, he's micing me up and he's putting the microphone up my shirt and, you know, doing all this. And we're talking. And he goes, you're feeling better. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm feeling better. I stayed up all night making a shirt. And he's like, he's looking at it and he's reading it. C-I-C-A. And C-I-C-H-A. Chica. And Chica is the word for women. <laughs> I spent all night making a great shirt that says women are the devil I forgot the H I forgot the extra H it's C-H-I-C-H-A not C-I-C-H-A Chica Chicha I was like once again Chicha gets the best of me and then there was a woman who thought it was offensive for me to wear the shirt on air and I was just I was like who are you you don't even work for the show and so because she was Peruvian, I wore it inside out. So you kind of see some of the shirt. And on one of my shoulders there, you see the, the arrow pointing the H into the shirt. Um, those are things that will never really make the story of the show. But these are things that I talk about when I do public speaking. If I'm at a, a culinary event, if I'm at a, a trade show, if I'm at a county fair. Um, and some people pick up on that shit and some people care and some people don't. But uh, it was a really good trip. So I wanted to get back to Canada a day early. There are two things that you do not want to do when you're traveling to or from Peru. Any, anybody? Okay, I'll tell you. You don't want to leave a day early and you don't want to leave a day late. And I found this out the hard way at the airport. When you fuck with your itinerary in the country that produces the second most cocaine on planet Earth, they're very interested into why you're changing your itinerary. You've either swallowed too early or you've had to sit around and wait for somebody to get you what you're taking back to your country. So the day early is like, you just want to get out because it's in you now and you want to bypass. So the, the, the customs agents in Lima at the airport don't speak very good English or so they let on, but they know how to ask a fucking question. And they asked some very pointed questions. Why are you leaving early? Do you not like our country? Why don't you want to stay one more day like your itinerary says so? What's the rush? And you're like, uh, uh, I'm a drug mule. <laughs> like they talk you into that corner. I was like, you know, I, I wasn't feeling very well and I just want to go home and see my kids for Canada Day. And they're like, well, if you're not feeling very well, maybe you should stay because you shouldn't travel when you're not feeling very well. And it's like Jedi mind trick. And the interesting thing about Ica, the fifth driest desert in the world, they did shoot some scenes. I don't know which Star Wars movie it was, but one, some of Star Wars was filmed in that desert where we were sandboarding and dune bugging. Um, and then if you stay a day late, it's like, well, why didn't you make your flight yesterday? What caused you to miss your plane back home to where you're from? 
because you're a drug mule and you know you were waiting for your guy and so you do not want to mess with your itinerary if you go to Colombia I'm assuming being number 1 on the list or Peru being number 2 because they will work you over and most flights back to North America go through Miami and Miami has the number 1 drug testing facility of all airports in North America and they will put you in a hot box and they will make you sit there until you poop or pee something so they can figure out if you've actually ingested or swallowed anything. I didn't have to go through that part of it. But I tell you, the questioning at the airport, I've never been more hands on my body before. Um, it didn't take away from the experience. It only added to it and gave me a great story to tell after the fact. Um, and I bought a couple of really nice bottles and I had a bottle of... Um, Peace go from uh, Johnny Schuler given to me. And because of the interrogation and the length of time it took before my flight, because I was really pushing to get the last flight out, um, because if I missed that flight that I was trying to get to on Air Canada, I would have had to be in, uh, in Peru for another day and a half. So I would have, it wasn't worth it. So I had to leave four bottles of Peace go behind at the airport, which I'm sure the customs agents enjoyed once they were out of my hands. So, um, but boo hoo for me. Uh, anyway, a great trip, a great experience. I highly, um, Machu is, is a lot of effort going to Machu Pisco, Machu Picchu, sorry, not Machu Pisco. <laughs> God, those girls, I tell you, Melanie and, and Lizzie Hatcher got it right when they named their product. Um, it's, it's a lot of effort, but it, it's, it's worth it. If you get up as high as Ola Tatambo and Cusco, you can pretty much say that you've done it. Um, the hike from Cusco, sorry, the hike, the, the hike from Ola Tatambo to Machu, I think is three days. If you're doing the walk with the Sherpas and there is a switchback train that takes a day. And it's just one of those trains that climbs the mountain like this. It's quite incredible. It's quite expensive. Um, but even if you got up to Olenta Tambo, you pretty much, you see from nine to 11,000 feet, uh, the beauty of this great country, uh, very blessed to, uh, have been there and, and to do such a good story on, uh, on the people and the, the stuff that they make. Yeah. I'm on to beer now. Cause my, uh, this was sour. Uh... Oh. <laughs> I'm on the third. I'm on the third sour now. He just keeps making them. <laughs> I have to go squeeze some more lemons. <laughs> you know, um, what was that? <clears throat> you, you, Johnny, is it Johnny Hunter? He was a he was a Canadian country western. Tommy Hunter. He had like a, he had an entertainment show like on Sunday oh. evenings. It was music yeah, and Hunter. yeah, Tommy Hunter. Tommy, the Tommy Hunter, Hunter show. Hunter. Yes. Tommy Hunter. There was a notorious story. So they um. They shot that out in Scarborough at the CFTO studios, the CTV studios where TSN is based right now in Sportsnet. So if you watch Jay and Dan at all or anything like that on TSN, um, same, same studios. And they would have uh, pina colada and daiquiri nights <laughs> on, on, on set. Offset, they had three blenders, apparently. When you start working with these guys, you go in there doing morning TV. I would go on and do Canada AM and make drinks. I think Aaron, you've probably done it. Nick, I think you've probably done it as well. You know, where you just provide some content, you know, around the holidays for um, for local TV, for live morning television. They would tell the stories, the old camera guys, about how Tommy Hunter's show <laughs> was just the best show on planet Earth to work on because Sundays you couldn't get alcohol in Ontario very readily, <laughs> and if Sunday night you go to work and you work on the Tommy Hunter show, you get paid overtime and you'd be drinking pina coladas and margaritas and daiquiris <laughs> the television program and they just right. they would go off about that so you know um it's a great opening line <laughs> alcohol <laughs> <laughs> why do you drink the alcohol <laughs> always <laughs> what a so hoot I'm really good at goodbyes, so I don't know how this thing ends. I mean, how did it work out? I know we're still working out the technology. This was a bit of a... Uh, that was the first go. What's that? It yeah. was the first go. It was the first go. 
Um, we're gonna we're gonna we'll we'll sit down and post mortem. But did it work out okay for everybody? I know the the sound was a bit iffy and, and stuff like that. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fine tune and hone some stuff out. And if you guys have any comments, we'll be back. We're definitely fun. gonna be back. I'd love to come back. This was fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I miss your show. I actually miss your show. I we used to watch your show. I love your show. You need to do a reboot. Dude. Well, we're trying. We're trying. I mean, I'm I'm not trying as hard as I could be. I'll be honest with you, but uh, we are we are trying. We we worked in a we were a very small team. There was really only four of us that went on the road. We would pick up um we would pick up some ground support, a driver. The first year we drove ourselves. God damn it, which was wow. stupid. I would always take the morning shift because I was best in the mornings. And by the afternoon, there was no way I should be driving. It was socially irresponsible. So I would never drive past <laughs> noon. Um, and then the second year we, we said, no, we, we have to pick up somebody on the ground. You know, and it was, it was just easier. It was faster. We were much more expeditious. Um, but we pick up a translator in some countries. Sometimes the tourism bureau would, um, would would be of assistance or or some of the big parent companies like uh diageo or perno ricard constellation brands they would you know if, if we were favoring them in a certain light within our show you know, we never knocked anything we never like killed anything if we didn't have anything nice to say we couldn't say it um there's just so much good that comes out of um the the, the realm of hospitality of food and drink you know restaurants were built as far as a horse could, you know restaurants and inns back in the day were built as far as a horse could kind of ride in a day mm -hmm. and there was you were lucky if you could get to that place by nightfall and you know there was a place to to put your horse and you know there was no menu <laughs> it was just there was something in a pot kind of like chicha and you'd eat it or you'd drink <laughs> it and you'd be happy that you had that at your avail you know but hospitality is is a is a noble profession I, I i think it's as noble as being a doctor or a nurse when when practiced in in the right in the right way in the right means you know and um i truly believe that if you're if you're put on this planet like like born to serve and born to take care of others um it, it's no less um important in a in a in a hospital in a in a hospitality setting versus say a medical setting you know I'm, I'm not phrasing my words exactly correct it might be you know the peace goes sour and the couple of beers that i've had but you know i think you know what i'm getting at thank you Beth. <laughs> no, I, yeah i would agree with that we uh i think for one of my other favorite shows that you did and i think the people were part of it kevin the the show's and the people when yeah. you met them, yeah, they genu like they genuinely were interested in sharing their, in like their food, their culture. You were super interested, and that was what was so interesting. Everybody was authentic and really loving what the conversation was about. Yeah, we. I mean, we. we I, I don't want to say we worked really hard at it because it came very natural to us. We were a small group, you know, like on on Lonely Planet. And on Bourdain's first show, there was probably anywhere from 12 to 20 people. On our show, there was there was me, Mike, and, and Brad. Wow. Plus, we had a fourth person we called the credit card. And that was a revolving <laughs> window of one of four people. And that was basically a holiday for them. They would just come along and they would exec produce the episode. So we called them the credit card. But it was Brad and Mike and I. We were like the Beastie Boys. And the three of us, you know, the, Mike, Mike recorded every bit of sound in all of the episodes. Brad shot every piece of tape. And Brad and I, I called him my, my dance partner because he would know if I looked at the camera and said something and I looked away, he'd know I was going to come back and Jack Benny that shit. And that was our dance, right? And you, you can't, you can't, I guess you can learn it, but... Anyway, we'd go into houses and we would be, it was very uncomfortable with some of these people. As much as the show was about me, it wasn't about me. It was about me getting the best out of the people that were on camera yeah. with me. And um, we, 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 I mean, we had our routine of where we would start silent rolling. And we always would have a drink first just to unwind them and relax them. And I'd start asking them questions that I had no interest in asking them about the show. I would ask them about, 
I don't know, maybe some of the artwork on the wall or, or the, the lights or, or the, you know, anything mundane. And then I get them talking and talking and talking. And then they would kind of almost, you know, seven times out of 10, they would go, so when are we going to start? And I'd say, well, we already have. And, and they were like, what? Wow. And, and that's when you knew that you were comfortable because you don't want to just go and it's not 60 minutes. Right. I, I really have to come across and I did. And I did have a relationship with these people. Even if I just met them a half an hour earlier, an hour earlier, I'd walk their gardens. I toured their house. We talked about their products. You know, I try and save the important questions for, 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 for tape for video, um, it, it takes a bit of trust, but when you have four really decent people, you know, Canadians first and foremost, but you know, global citizens coming into your house, when Bush was in administration in the United States and people thought we were American, we were in Italy um, and we were with a noni in a, in a kitchen doing a, a, a kitchen scene. And this was for our grappa episode. And they just brought out some shit wine and put it on the table. And after about a half an hour, they realized they, uh, they, they I can't remember. No, United States, Canadays, Canadays. Oh, and you know things would, and and things changed, right? Like, and you'd notice the wine got swapped out for better wine. <laughs> but but that was sort of gaining the people's trust and and having, knowing that we weren't there to like take advantage of them. We were there to thankfully they were willing to help us tell their story and it was their story you know um the joy on those days every day was very different you know some days was all about being outside and getting exteriors and and me just chewing through all of those lines and all of that detail which i would rather do on camera than do in a voiceover you know i want to see you i want to i want to be looking down the lens giving you the information about a said material be it wine you know beer or spirit rather than having me read it in a in a in a in a in, a, in an audio booth somewhere in scarborough you know I, I want to lay it down if we have to go to the audio booth in scarborough when we get back because there's no other choice but i want the option of taking it live from the street because that's what gave the show its energy you know and then days that we were doing cooking scenes if not in a restaurant but in a family home those were very gentle days and they had a totally different energy on them. And then you'd get to listen to Mike, the sound guy, go, yeah, he always gets to eat first. He's the host of the show. So we got to sit here and we got to tape him. And, you know, I got to listen to him eat and talk to the people. And then once we're all said and done, then we get our food. And I'm kind of going, Mike, you're such a dick. Like, you know, you should have been a host then if you wanted to eat first, Mike. You know, Um but I, I wouldn't have done the show without, with, with no one else than those two boys. The, I love those guys dearly. I miss them a bunch. I just saw Brad for the first time in about five years uh, this past July in Calgary. And uh, it was just such good fun. He was like the old, Mc, the, he was like the curmudgeon. He was uh, definitely an analog guy, listened to vinyl, smoked cigars, drank whiskey, like Miles Davis and, and dial up telephone. And then Mike was the audio guy. He was young, newfie, and married and indig his wife's is indigenous, a uh, seven nations woman. Uh, they're into like thrash metal, tattoos, <laughs> piercings. And th the three of us were such a good track. And I'm somewhere in the middle of both of them, right? So on the days I wanted to feel kind of, <laughs> I'd hang out with Brad and have a smoke in the lounge and, and you know, in Scotland at the Craigalachie and, and have a fine scotch. And, well and then I would want to, you know, when I wanted to just be a fucking punk, I'd hang out with Mike and, uh, <laughs> and we'd go to a dive bar. Now I get why you and I get along so well. How was, the, uh, how was the time in Scotland with the scotch? It was a great show. Uh, it, was, it was just wonderful to watch. What was the, the, your, what did you think they, about it? You know what? That that was our very first episode when wow. we when we we went from we went into Dufftown and we were up at Lafroig and the McKellen and um, a real hard bit of subject material 
when it comes to the world of spirits to cut your teeth on, right? Because I was I was pretty fresh right. still then. I knew my stuff, but I didn't, you know, know my stuff like I know it now. And the first show is always a real hard one because it doesn't have it doesn't have a format yet. You're creating the format, which is one of the reasons why a lot of first shows are so rich. Because if you think you've nailed it, what you basically do in terms of say editing and pacing every show that follows the first one is sort of a mirror of that first one. So it, you, you kind of go, we're, we're going to do it like the first one. So we're going to sunrise, sunset, and then we're going to do this and we're going to show some lifestyle. We did it so well on the first one. And man, we fought, we fought every single day on that show and exhausted the life out of us. Um, and yet we come away with like that, that show is largely considered by a lot of the people, you know, the fans of the show and the people that I speak to as being one of the favorites. And I find that like a really rare thought that the first one is often the best, Yeah. but it, it, it paved the way for everything that came afterwards. And I notice a lot of those things, you know, if, if you work in television, you'll notice a lot of things that are like, Oh, this this episode is so off the rack. It's so, you know, it's so cookie cutter to all of the other episodes. And, and they're not really, they're all their own unique child, but they're all cut from the cloth of the, the Scottish one. And, you know, that was fabulous eye opener. And, and I didn't know the boys as well, right? Brad and I hadn't really established the dance that I was talking about earlier. You know, he didn't know that I was gonna, he didn't know my mannerisms and I didn't know his and, you know, Mike, the sound guy, would always have a, a funny thing. I could always tell when Mike was tired or homesick because Mike would show up in the morning and we'd have breakfast. Brad and I typically would go for a run, even if it was just a walk and we'd move our arms like this and go for coffee. But we would want to have a scene in our day before, you know, we got into the van and started doing the shit. And um, I say the shit lovingly, but it's still on some days it was like no better than working in a bank, I believe. Right. Um, but Mike would always come down and I would, I would, I would take the, the side view mirror of the van that we were in and I tilt it this way and I'd put some cover up on my, uh, on these two parts of my head because of the shiny <laughs> my spots, put some on my nose and that was my makeup. But I didn't have a makeup artist following me and traveling with me. I did it my own. I had a nice little Mac kit and I would kind of go like that and that. And then Mike would look at me and he'd get ready to insert the microphone down my shirt and he'd go, <sighs> You gonna wear that today? <laughs> yep. I, I, and 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 this I, is when I, I could tell that Mike was homesick or he, he was just tired and like grumpy. Mike, it's like uh, I, don't, I don't know how I'm gonna mic this. I, I don't know. Oh. How I'm gonna, I was like, Mike, I wore this two days ago, right? This is a continuity day. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I was like, yeah, Mike, I did. <laughs> it's the continuity shirt. You mic this two days ago. You can mic it today. It's like. <sighs> You know, An another show I liked was the the Aquavit one. Yeah, that just that just yes. blew me away. That was a, another yeah. one. What was your feelings about that one? Um, they, they scammed us a little bit on that one. They weren't really making Aquavit. <laughs> oh, my heart's broken now, Kevin. That's just terrible. No, I'm not taking away anything from them, but. Remember how I said, like, like I, I would never drink a glass of water and pretend it was Pisco when I was sick. I was uh, if, if you're really yeah. concerned about my health, we take a couple of days off, get me back to normal, or I'm going to just keep doing what I do. And I did that. And <laughs> like you could see on my face when I was drinking the Pisco, I was like, Ugh. wasn't giving it the, you know, the vote of confidence that I normally would. Uh, these guys were making basically, they were teabagging water. They didn't have the green neutral spirit in the tank on the day that we were there. And it wasn't until we got to the the end of Act Two where we were sitting around with uh, like the the smorgasbord that goes along with Aquavit. Depends now. Which one are you talking about? The Danish one or the Swiss one or the Swedish one? Sorry, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. But uh, there's a guy I work with. Was his last name was uh, uh, Pedersen. 
and well, he that would have been, that would have probably been Swedish. That one was legit. The, 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 the Danish one that we did was not legit. Uh, and in, on, at the Swedish one, we were, we were um, in country um, oh, by the town where uh, Matt Sundin is from. Uh, it's on a lake. And we were there for um, summer solstice. Again, we, we, we were in Alaska for summer solstice. We were in uh, Peru for summer solstice, which is actually winter solstice because it's south of the equator. Um, we were in Sweden for summer solstice, and we sang, Hey, Langor, for la, 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 Hey, Langor. Sounds about right. <laughs> and um, that, was a, that was a lovely episode, and that was totally legit. Uh, but the Danish one, they, they, a little bit of a, mm. you know, mm. not to say anything more than that, but. It happens, to, right? Uh, pardon me? It happens in television. There's not much you can do. Well, yeah, because people want the exposure so badly. They'll do almost anything. They'll bend over yeah. backwards. And, and you know, you've traveled halfway around the world, and you, you have to find a way to make it work, but you have to be able to leave with your integrity intact. And, you know, like I said, it, it's easier to not say anything. We went down to Griffith, Australia, and we went to that winery that I mentioned earlier that I won't mention again in this context. And there was no passion there. They had seven winemakers on the board and we couldn't meet one winemaker at this facility. And we didn't get a sample while we were there. We didn't get a takeaway bottle. Not that's why I can buy a bottle of wine. I don't need to get a gift pack every time I leave a winery, brewery or distillery. I was just amazed that the only person that we could meet with was the vice president of North American marketing and advertising. Wow. Mm. It was really, it was really sort of off putting and they wanted us to shoot their bottling line and they wanted us to shoot um, the pallets in their warehouse just to show how much wine they were making. Casella wineries is a family winery um, in the middle of, in Griffith, Australia. And, um, the two sons were uh, educated in the United States and they came back. And when uh, the Australian wine market was having a problem, these two guys put their education to work and came up with a really successful product for, you know, the country of Australia. And um, there's just a lot of better wines out there for the price point that their wine is, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah. I, I was gonna, I was gonna interject there. I'm gonna stop the live stream part of it um, sure. right now. Yeah, because we're like at an hour and a half. It's been wonderful. I love the stories, but we can keep going in here. I'm just gonna, like I said, I'm just gonna pull the live I stream. Gotta, I gotta pee soon. I gotta pee soon. So okay, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't but, like, we can wrap things up. Yeah, yeah. Does, does it seem like we can do this again? Tonight? I don't know. Would you guys, would you guys sit in, Jeff? Would you sit in again? Yeah, yeah. JJ. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll say this. this Next again? week, I'm going to challenge Chef and Nick to a shake off. Okay. It's on. Four way shake off. It's on. We can do that. Shake -off. So, so we have to make a we have to make a shake cocktail. Yeah. Completely. I, I think that's money. That's money. It's money for this. I'll send yeah. you guys a bottle. Where Where are we going oh, next week? Look so at the Send the bottle. Okay. <laughs> Done. So Thanks, we never everybody. Did, we never did Thank an you, episode. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. It was magic. It, maybe we'll look at a liqueur episode. We'll look at uh, okay, and then we'll but we'll work with the disarrange. Okay, okay, okay. So we're gonna keep this. We're gonna keep this alive. <laughs> and are we gonna? Are we? Are we thinking maybe next Thursday or the Thursday after? We're gonna keep to this time slot. We'll keep the so time slot. We'll talk about the next date though to make sure it okay. works for you and everything. So okay. Yeah. It's got to work for him. It's got to work for him. It's got to work for her. It's <laughs> for everyone. I'm not going anywhere. Gives you a wee warm-up for the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Gives you a wee for the weekend. Yeah. I'm sitting at home drinking every night anyway. I may as well do it with you guys. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I like your thinking. You got points on that one. Yeah. JJ, just so you know, when we talk in the afternoon, I'm already half snapped. <laughs> 11 o'clock is start time. 11 o'clock. Love you, man. Yeah. Love you, man. <laughs> this ball ran out. This is actually Belvany Doublewood. Ooh. Oh my God. Easy, easy. Hold. We have the right crowd here Hold. for this kind of party. <laughs> Thank you, okay. everybody, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. everybody. Thank you, Kevin, so much. This is yeah, good to see you, buddy. Thank you for all the hard work you guys did. You did a lot more than I did. Oh, fun, <laughs> fun, fun, fun. Thanks, fun. Kevin. Yeah, you Thanks, just dropped eggs. Everyone, have a great night. I really appreciate it. Okay. And we'll talk to you all soon, okay? Okay. Ciao, everyone. Yeah, social media anytime you want. Thank you, guys.